Radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. Well, 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 good evening, Fade to Black. Today is Monday, June 26th, 2023. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Let's do this, man. Monica requested that. I haven't said that in years, but there you go, Monica. I, I hope I made your day. Don't really do shout outs tonight on the show. Seth Showstack is with us. And tonight we're going to be talking about SETI, of course, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence and alien hunting. It's the title of his book, by the way. And he is the senior astronomer at SETI the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, Not only that, though, Seth is now a podcast host, co-host. And uh, and I'm going to talk about that, too, as well. This podcast, of course, is called Big Picture Science. And you can go and check that out. And his his website, Seth Shostak and, and SETI and everything else, links are below. They're over on social media. They're on our website. And I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black, Seth Shostak. There he is. Seth, It's it's been a while. How have you been? Well, I've been fine, Jimmy, and I'm fading up to, to orange to match your shirt. <laughs> right on. This is This is the classic STP pit crew shirt from uh, Richard Petty back in the day. And you and I are the same age. So, you know, you know what those glory days of those STP logos. (laughs) Glory days of yesteryear. That's right. Yeah, totally, totally, totally. Now, um, there is so much uh, going on uh, right now. And we've got so much to uh, discuss tonight. And to think um, the the couple of times that you've been on with us, which was, you know, before uh, all this craziness has happened, um, uh, it was a different conversation back then. Today, you must be getting hit left and right with all kinds of questions. But I'm going to ask you something that you've never been asked before. You ready? I, I think so. I'm sitting down. Yeah, here's here's the thing, Seth. You've you've done so much, right? Of film and television and writing and everything and radio. You've you've done so much, but you've never been asked this. All right. Okay, so here we go. Over the last six months, there has been reports about different things happening with the Earth's core the Earth's tilt, and the Earth's spin. And uh, over the last week, we've got fresh stuff in about groundwater drilling, right? (laughs) And it has changed our tilt. As crazy as that sounds, um, does that affect, uh, and uh, are you guys prepared? Is that written into the software where... You know, you're looking at, you're beaming out to Zeta Reticuli, (laughs) and suddenly it's not there. Well, uh, Jimmy, I'm not sure about this story, but it is true that uh, every time you, you know, move anything around on the Earth, you're going to change its spin axis a little bit. In fact, when I was in grad school, one of the professors asked me in an oral exam, he said, all right, I want you to give me a number, just make an estimate of the amount that the Earth's spin axis moves from, you know, the North Pole, nominally the North Pole, uh, on a Sunday afternoon when all these cars drive out of New York City, you know, redistributing the mass of the Earth. And, you know, you can make an estimate. I mean, that's that's just physics, uh, sophomore, sophomore physics, if you will. So these things happen. It isn't a whole lot. The, the pole moves by, you know, it's measured in feet. It might go 10 feet or something like that. But it mm-hmm. doesn't 
you know, it isn't that the North Pole suddenly pops out in Ethiopia or anything like that. But uh, so the 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 mass that has shifted and the the tilt, I, I had the measurement. I reported on the latest uh, news uh, about this earlier today. Um, and I would think that all of the stuff around the globe, and that is uh, it, not only uh, radio telescopes, normal telescopes and observatories, and anybody that's looking to the heavens, is going to find their sensor data off a, a little bit uh, when they're trying to point at something. Well, it is true that it's going to make introduce an error in your pointing, but it isn't much of an error. I mean, if you're talking about moving the pole 10 feet, right, w what is that in, in degrees? Well, you know, a degree is what, 60 miles or something like that? 60 nautical miles. So, you know, have, having it move a, a, a tiny fraction of a degree means that the the pole is pointing at a, yeah, slightly different place, but it's not going to really affect anything, right? It's like okay. you know, the fact that, that the gravity changes when you go up and down, you know, an elevator. Yeah, it does, but it's not something you notice. You don't lose 30 pounds by going up in an elevator. Wish that it were true, but it's not. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. But I, you've never been asked that, have you? See, uh, I just wanted to, I just wanted to start off on on that uh, on that footnote. Um, the uh, uh, there there's a few things that I, I I want to try to. I study physics. I study astronomy. This is what I do. Um, I'm always uh chasing I, i'm trying to get science and my community to line up and it seems like we're starting to kind of get there uh a little bit or we're, we're getting closer um and and even with the mainstream media but uh there's there's another component to this which um and sagan wasn't the first he certainly talked about this but that is the frequency of hydrogen. Um, and so is that, is, I understand how narrow uh, it is and, and the number, and it's around 1,600 or so. Um, is, that, is that what you guys mainly look for in that narrow band? Are you guys looking for hydrogen? Well, uh, we're not looking for hydrogen. The three quarters of the universe by weight is oh, yeah. hydrogen there's that but but the, but the, the that's, frequency the frequency of yeah, hydrogen. The hydrogen frequency well we do use it as a marker i mean it's like if anybody remembers the uh the radios of years past many years past now but you know they would have two little pyramid looking uh, markings on the dial right which were the connell rad frequencies and those were the frequencies you were supposed to tune your radio to in case of a nuclear attack because uh, you know the government would broadcast on those frequencies what you should do about it if, if if there was anything to be done. But anyhow, so those were marked on everybody's dial. Well, the frequency of neutral hydrogen, which by the way is at fourteen twenty megahertz for anybody who really cares. Fourteen twenty. Um, yeah, fourteen twenty point four zero five nine point. Yeah, it just keeps going. But those are those are frequencies of an emission of a signal. That's just made by hydrogen gas. Now, if you go out into deep space, I don't know if your plans this weekend include going out into deep space, but if you go out into deep space, you'll find that a receiver that you might have, a radio receiver, will make some sort of noise at 1420.4059 megahertz on the dial. It's just a, a fact of nature. But we know that. The aliens will also know it because they have the same physics that we do. Right. And so if they're trying to get in touch, right, maybe they don't even know we're here, but if they're just trying to get in touch with somebody, they might broadcast a signal at that frequency on the assumption that we have receivers that are, you know, monitoring it just for doing astronomy, stuff like that. So it's it's a it's a frequency that would be monitored by any technologically sophisticated society. So that's why it's kind of interesting. Why why um, I, I always say it's better than doing nothing, right? And, and there are different things, like Arecibo, for instance. There was 
uh, even inside of our community, um, I always thought that Arecibo was a good thing. And everybody just wants instant gratification and instant satisfaction these days. And that Arecibo wasn't trying hard enough. And my argument always, it, what's the alternative to do nothing? I just don't think that's the right approach. And it's it's the same thing uh, with anybody that is trying to do stuff. You or Avi Loeb and the Galileo Project. Uh, what what's the alternative? And and the question is always out there: Why hunt for aliens when we've got issues here on Earth we've got to take care of? Yeah, well, you get that a lot, but you can get that. Uh, no matter really what basic research you do. If you're doing applied research, you can always say, oh, well, you know, we're understanding how cells work or something like that. That'll be important when it comes to the new treatments or cancer, for example. You can, you can justify applied research that way. But basic research, just trying to understand how the cosmos works. You know, a lot of people will say, well, I don't care about any of that because it doesn't have any obvious practical application. People who say that don't don't know, I guess, they don't know that all the big advances in applied research, you know, medicine or whatever, you know, something that might, you know, improve our lives, all of those stem from basic research ultimately. So basic research is the first thing you do. And uh, if you give up on basic research, you're never going to get those benefits from applied research. And that's a long way of saying that this, this kind of work actually has payoffs. The um, uh, the numbers game is is different today, and it's changed a lot since 1995 with you know the discovery and confirmation of the first uh, exoplanet. It took us what four or five years to get up to the number five, but but now it's it's in the thousands, and we have so much of that going on. But if we back this up um, to uh, to Drake and and to Fermi and to that era in the fifties, when the there was a question of uh, is there anything else beyond our star system, right, or, or or is Earth all there is, right? Well, now we know um, uh, the number just in our own Milky Way is probably a trillion planets, and how many are rockety, rocky in the Goldilocks zone. Well, that's anybody's guess, but it would certainly be in the tens, if not hundreds of billions. And that's that's a, that's a crazy big number. In in your opinion, uh, does that would 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 Frank Drake had written that equation differently or thought about things differently? The number he came up with was 10,000 planets. If you remember, right when he ran the the first equation, and and Fermi Enrico, would he be shouting the same things today that he did in the Los Alamos cafeteria back in 1952? Um, it's a numbers game, isn't it? Well, it is, and you know, you uh, talk about Frank Drake and what his numbers were for some of these quantities, and for those who uh, don't remember, Frank Drake, you know, wrote down this equation in 1961, I believe it was, as an agenda for a meeting he was about to have on the possibility that we might find, you know, evidence or aliens out there in the galaxy. So he just wanted to organize the meeting. And he wrote down this equation as his agenda, right? All it does is try to estimate how many societies are out there. He didn't really mean it as a piece of science, I suspect. It was just, you know, a way of organizing what they were going to talk about for the couple of days that everybody was there in Green Bank, West Virginia, enjoying the, the food and the company. So, uh, th you know, that, that's what it was. But he had to make an estimate for things that we didn't know. I mean, that's still true. And one of the things we don't know, of course, is how many planets are out there in the Milky Way galaxy, our galaxy, how many out there that, uh, you know, could support life? In other words, that they have, you know, temperatures that aren't too extreme, they have atmospheres, they may have oceans, that kind of thing. How many are there? And the answer is we don't know, not from direct observation. But his estimate was, as you say, something like 10,000 planets that might be somewhat like the Earth. We, we still don't know whether that's the right number, but it doesn't seem unreasonable. When um, uh, uh, I, had a, I had dinner with Avi Loeb a few months ago, and, in, and at dinner, we're sitting 
uh, next to each other, having this conversation that you and I are having right now. And I threw out a number. Um, I said, well, you know, we got a trillion stars, you know, maybe, maybe 10 billion Rocky plan. He, he, he corrected me. He, he body slammed me, Seth. (laughs) He just threw me on the ground. He said, Jimmy, it's over a trillion planets. Has to be, has to be. He said, no, I'm just, let me get, let me tell you what he said. He said, and so if you just take a fraction of a trillion planets, uh, just a fraction of that number, you're, you're, you're at a hundred billion. If you're at a small fraction, he said, and that's where we are today. It has just thrown everything off of, of what we assumed before, uh, just, just a couple of decades ago. And that, that's a crazy thought to me. And it must be just for astronomy and astronomers overwhelming because there is so much to, to, to look at and and search for. Well, yeah. I I mean, who am I to, you know, challenge what Avi has said, but he's, he's using numbers that we kick around routinely. And that is how many planets are out there in particular, how many, as you say, are out there that, uh, you know, might, might spawn life, even intelligent life. And, you know, The answer to that is relatively new. I mean, in 1994, we didn't know about any planets beyond Earth, right? right, 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 Then in 1995, we find a a couple around a particular star system. Then we find some more, and then we find some more. And eventually, you know, we found a couple of thousand, 4,000 plus planets around other stars. But that wasn't really the interesting number. The interesting number, of course, was what fraction of stars have planets? And the modern answer to that, uh, based on more observations, is that maybe one out of three or four stars, stars like the sun, right, Uh, and and those comprise maybe 8 or 10% of all stars, one out of three or four of those has a planet that's roughly the same size as the Earth and roughly the same distance from its uh, home sun so that the temperatures on that planet are neither too hot nor too cold for life. In other words... This is just an estimate of how many cousins of Earth are out there in our own galaxy. And the answer there is, uh, yeah, hundreds of hundreds of billions. I mean, it's 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 a it's a big 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 number. number. It's a big (laughs) number. It's a and and the um, the, here's the other thought. This is the way my mind works. Think about the phone book, right? The, the uh, what well, there used to be these things, Seth, called phone books. Right? <laughs> I have some in my basement here. <laughs> exactly, and and you know, and you got excited when your name was fine. You know, and you open up, and oh yeah, I made it to print. Right? Okay. So, uh, but if we're if we're getting into a hundred billion, what size? What kind of database are we talking? You know, the size that. It's just an insane amount of work. And the way that Tess and and Hubble and, you know, James Webb and, and these different systems that are in place to look for exoplanets, they can do them pretty quickly, but there's trillions. <laughs> well, it's there's trillions, trillions. But, but it's not easy to find trillions. You're not actually dealing with trillions. Yeah, there are probably a trillion planets in the Milky Way, but the, how many of them do we know about, right? Well, we know about a, a few thousand, that's all. And that's a list you can get on a couple of sheets of paper. So I, I wouldn't worry too much about this. I mean, obviously, you are interested in how many the, t- the total might be. But, you know, that's an estimate based on what fraction of the stars that you've actually looked at have planets. And then you just extrapolate that to the whole galaxy. So sure, uh, sure, it's not sure. that we have a list of a trillion planets. No, no, maybe no. that's and that's what I'm saying. Eventually, when we catalog everything, you know, like Star Trek, you know, this is an un, un, uncharted planet, you know, let's give it a number. Eventually, that is going to be a huge database. Now, this is uh, a, a, another direct question. Not all parts of our Milky Way are 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 nice like ours. We happen to live in a pretty timid area where uh, radiation and, and, and things are, but there are sections of the Milky Way where nothing could live. And I understand that. I, I, I totally get it. 
if you were a betting man, is there a section of the Milky? Is it our neighborhood that feels really good? Are there other parts of the Milky Way that you're interested in that have a better chance uh, because of its environment? Well, if you're talking about looking for life, uh, it's true. Not not all <laughs> neighborhoods are created equal. If you go to the center of the galaxy, the center of the Milky Way galaxy, and if you're planning to do that, that's about what is it? It's roughly twenty eight thousand light light years away from you know downtown Pittsburgh. So it's it's a ways, but um, you know you you wouldn't want to go there anyhow because there's a tremendous amount of radiation and stars occasionally bang into one another and so on and so on. But in our part of the galaxy, we're you know we're kind of in the suburbs. In our part of the galaxy, there are uh, you know well there are a lot of planets, and the number of uh, planets that uh, you know are sort of like the Earth, maybe one in ten, something like that. If you say that you're willing to buy into the fact that there are a trillion planets in the Milky Way, and ten percent of forget ten percent, let's say one percent of them, right, are the kind of planet you wouldn't mind buying some real estate on and erecting your you know your split level. Uh, dream out, something like that. That's still 10 billion such planets. So no matter how you slice it, no matter what assumptions you want to make or don't want to make, the facts are that there's an awful lot of real estate that's at least modestly attractive in our own galaxy. And we can photograph, uh, what, a couple of hundred billion other galaxies, each with a similar amount of real estate. So you know, the bottom line is if you're one of those people who likes to say, you know, I don't think there are any aliens out there because there are no planets out there that would be good enough for them. You know, that's a pretty strong statement in view of these numbers. And the, I, I think that view um, ha, has changed radically uh, lately. It's it, it's getting harder and harder to be skeptical uh, and have a position that we are all that there is. You know, just in the numbers game, it's not that we are not all there is. There's a lot of stuff out there. There there just has to be. We just have to find it. Yeah. I, I've even heard it argued that, you know, people complain, oh, gosh, darn, you know, we'll never find another solar system that's as salubrious, so attractive mm -hmm. as our own, right? But I, I read an article somewhere, I don't even remember where, where the person was arguing that actually our situation, our sun, our planet, you know, they're really actually kind of lousy. And we really deserve something better. And most, most of the other uh, inhabitants of the galaxy are living in a better situation than we are. I don't know whether this is grass is greener kind of argument, but uh, I thought it was intriguing at least. Now, how um, uh, today, um, how, do, do you have a preferred method? And I'm not going to, uh, and that, that is on the listening side, right? Do you have a preferred method? Is it point and shoot? Uh, are there things uh, that you're interested in or, or have hunches on? Or do you just go one, one star at a time? Well, mostly the latter. Look, we, we make the assumption, it's just sort of a, beginning assumption that the best places to look for signals that might tell us that somebody's out there would be in star systems sort of like our own, which have a planet, at least one planet, sort of like the Earth. I mean, we don't know, you know, the, the details of these things. We don't actually have a list of all the nearby star systems that have an Earth-like planet. But, you know, you can at least try and narrow the field down a bit so that's the conservative assumption. We're looking for something like our own situation. But of course, it's pretty easy to make an argument that, well, I mean, don't be so parochial. I mean, it, it could be that the aliens have uh, colonized uh, giant swaths of the galaxy and they're living between planets on, you know, space stations or who knows what, or they have some other way of uh, arranging for their gusto grabbing lifestyles. And so everything you do is obviously. A kind of a lower limit, a kind of a, you know, a too conservative approach. So maybe the best thing to do is just to look everywhere. And to some extent, SETI experiments do do that. We look at a lot of different places. Now, and and what what is it that you're looking for? And, and before you answer, um, our window and, you know, this, uh, 
this argument has been put out there a few times, but it, it's very difficult to ignore. And that is our window of technology. Uh, you know, maybe we've been, if you want to go conservative, uh, okay, so we've been beaming t suitable television and radio signals for 100, 125 years, right? If you go back to Marconi and, and, and stuff, if you want to go that far back. But, but that's really it. It's a very small window of, of time. And, and if, if an alien civilization has gone through the same evolutionary processes that we have, would we also be looking at a very short window? And those waves could have already passed us a thousand years ago, right? Yeah. Well, that's possible. That's possible. I mean, that's a good point. Right, we couldn't find ourselves, right? Our right. sibling uh, civilization, we couldn't have found it, you know, uh, from a, a, a vantage point, say at the distance of, I don't know, Alpha Centauri or something like that, unless we were looking at just the right time for there to be signals coming off the earth. And that's only been happening, frankly, since the Second World War when we invented uh, high frequency, high powered transmitters. So, yeah, maybe there's this very narrow window in which you can detect the aliens. And if that's the case, maybe we'll never find any aliens. Uh, they, they spring up and they develop some technology. And then as soon as they develop high-powered transmitters, you know, they also develop the hydrogen bomb or whatever, and then they Correct. go off the air. So, uh, yeah, that's possible. That it, maybe the whole reason we haven't found anybody is that they don't hang around very long. Well, and and and, and we have the same concerns here in that, television and uh, we're using fiber optic cables now, you know, uh, 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 radio transmissions and, and, and TV signals are harder and harder to find and will soon be completely extinct and we will be a totally digital world. And if that's the case, what would you then be searching for? Uh, do your methods change for how you would detect alien life? Yeah, well, that's that's a point that's occasionally brought up, the fact that, you know, evidence that we're here may just be going away pretty soon. Just as we go on the air, you know, within 100 years, 200 years, you go off the air. That could be. Uh, and you're right that most communication isn't going to be done via, you know, AM radio or FM radio even. Uh, but on the other hand, to say that a society would stop transmitting anything into space, I I'm not sure about that because you know, the strongest signals leaving the earth are not, you know, the Jimmy Church uh, fade to black show. Uh, right. You know, they're actually radar. Radar is, those are the strongest signals. And I don't know that radar is going to go away anytime soon. It might last for who knows how long, but, you know, it's not something that uh, you can replace with fiber optic uh, cables. So, you know, some sort of transmissions from earth, I, I suspect uh, are here for the long haul. So, yeah. I mean, of course, the aliens could always look for something else, right? There are a lot of things they could look for. Uh, maybe eventually we'll have flashing lasers uh, to communicate with colonies in the solar system. Who knows what? But, you know, it, it's, it's hard to foresee what kind of signaling we'll be doing 100 or 200 years from now. And, and so what is it that you look for? Well, we look for, to begin with, radio transmission signals, radio signals. And we just look for, you know, signals that are essentially at one spot on the radio dial. They're at one frequency. That's the signature of a broadcaster, right? I mean, you know, if, if you're on the radio, you're not over the entire dial. You're at one spot on the dial. If you're a TV station, same deal, so forth. So we look for that kind of thing. As far as looking for laser communications, well, we, we just look for flashing lasers in the sky. And, uh, you know, because laser light is so peculiar. It's non-natural in a way, right? It's because it's at one frequency. It's basically at one color, right? It's a red laser or it's a green laser, whatever it is, but it isn't a white light laser. We don't use too many of those. So, uh, you know, that that's, that's the indication that, well, we don't know what they're saying, but at least they've built the hardware to say something. Do, do you, um, uh, do you have an opinion? I, <laughs> We're going to go in another direction in a, in a couple of minutes. But do you 
do you think that we are you on the skeptical side or do you think we're being visited right now? Well, I don't think we're being visited. At least I, I'm not being visited. Uh, and of course, my neighbors have never taken the time to visit me. But no, I don't think I don't think Earth is being visited. I think if we were being visited, there would be no way to cover that up. Right. And uh, consequently, I think everybody would know. And, you know, you could argue, oh, well, uh, nobody wants to fess up to this because they think the the public would panic. But, you know, looking at the effect on me now from visiting aliens, right, they, they haven't improved the traffic in my neighborhood. You know, they haven't improved my income. They haven't done anything. So I don't know why it would be kept a secret. But, uh, okay, so uh, it seems that, and, and I... It's, it's not even really an opinion anymore, but I'll just I'll still use the word seems. It seems that there is an argument uh, going on uh, and feathers being ruffled between the Department of Defense, intelli the intelligence community, um, uh, the Pentagon, Capitol Hill, and uh, about uh, UAPs. The evidence there, who's got the evidence, what has been discovered, what's going on in our skies, and it it there is and the media. You're right. There's a huge interest in this, and and the world wants to know. And the legislation was just introduced yesterday from Gillibrand, saying if you've got flying saucers, you've got six months to give up the goods. <laughs> We've never been. We've never had these conversations in public before, and that's where we are today. Yeah, I, I find that really quite interesting because I'm I'm interested to see what's said in the next six months. I mean, honestly, my personal take on this, based on not so much evidence, but just my gut feeling, is that if we were being visited, if the aliens really were here, it wouldn't just be the government that would know about it. And it certainly wouldn't be just the American government that knew about it. Right. You would assume that any government would know about it. But beyond that, you'd assume that there would be millions, maybe billions of people that knew about it, too, because I can't imagine that the aliens would come to Earth and agree among themselves. OK, and then remember, no matter what else you do, don't ever reveal your presence to anybody except the U.S. government. Right? You can reveal your presence to them because they'll keep it quiet. I don't know. It doesn't make any yeah, sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, OK. I would, I would normally, I would say, I'm with you on this one, Seth. I'm with you. Except today, there was a press release out of Japan with their Department of Defense over the 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 Japanese Defense Forces. They're showing pictures of what they believe to be extraterrestrial craft. They just had a press conference today. And and it, you're right. This isn't a United States thing. This is a global thing. This is an Earthling thing. And it seems that there were there would be many state actors involved if there was a cover up. Yeah, well, I agree with that. I'll, I'll have to look up the, the Japanese uh, statements on this because I haven't seen them. But, uh, you know, I wouldn't begrudge the uh, aliens the opportune, uh, opportunity to go to Japan and enjoy some good meals. Now, what about uh, oh, Seth? Don't be that sarcastic, because well, I, the I, best I, I food is in, in the United States. The best food is In and Out Burger. You know that. Yeah, you, there's, you, there's one like about two miles from where where I'm sitting on In and Out Burger. The best, the best. So, um, what about um, uh, the opposite? In other words, uh, looking if we're out there looking. And there's an intelligent civilizations out there. They're doing the exact same thing, right? Okay, very simple. And um, uh, one of the missions for uh, James Webb is techno signatures and and looking for these things. Um, do you, do you take the same approach uh, in looking for techno signatures? Or is it strictly in radio and electromagnetic, you know, uh, uh, signals? Yeah, electromagnetic radiation. Well, that's normally what we do, but right. it isn't because, you know, I figured, oh, that's the only thing you can do. Uh, it's the only thing that indeed we can do. But techno signatures might be a better way to go. I mean, 
right, I, I often say, well, if you wanted to find the pharaohs of Egypt, right, you're not going to find the pharaohs anymore. You're not even going to find their mummies. But you might find these big pointy buildings outside of Cairo that were built by the pharaohs. And that would tell you that they were once here. And those pyramids, you know, they're very long lasting. They've, they've been there for thousands of years. They'll undoubtedly be there for thousands of years more. So that may be the best thing to do. Instead of looking for signals or trying to track down aliens, you know, uh, sleeping on a park bench somewhere, just look for something big that they built, something that, you know, you, you realize can't be a natural uh, uh, artifact, but it's something that only intelligence could have constructed. I mean, that, that's maybe the thing to do. The trouble with that, I, that approach is only that you don't really know what they would build, right? I mean, you can make some guesses. Uh, they might put, you know, giant space stations out between here and the moon or who knows what. But uh, that might be a better way to go because that way you don't have to be looking at the same time that some signal comes into your antenna. Right. And it, there's, a, there's a lot of interest in TRAPPIST-1 uh, right now, uh, that star system, seven planets, uh, three of them are looking pretty good. What's the chatter, uh, with you and your astronomy buddies about TRAPPIST-1? Is there this elevated interest? Well, I haven't heard anybody talk about TRAPPIST-1 since I last talked about it. And, uh, I didn't find that terribly interesting when I talked about it, but it might be interesting in this sense. The TRAPPIST-1, as you know, uh, you know, the Trappist system has seven planets, I think, uh, three of which might be habitable in the sense that the Earth is habitable. And that suggests that you might not just have an inhabited world there. You might have three of them. And if you have three of them, you know, they might sort of sync up in the sense that they might, uh, you know, whichever is the more advanced of the, the three, you know, those citizens might, once they master, you know, local space travel, they might, you know, set up uh, colonies on the other two that are similarly uh, uh, amenable to their own forms of life. So it would be finding not another society, but finding a, another, you know, uh, if you will, network of inhabited worlds. And that might be interesting because you would obviously have traffic, information traffic between those those worlds. I mean, you know, the people would insist on getting their top 40 music on all three of those worlds or, you know, television shows or whatever it is. And that right. means there would be some signals coming off those three planets that you might, you might be able to find. Would ET be able to detect, say, Perseverance or uh, a Rover or uh, Cassini, right? Beaming messages of a Voyager, right? V'ger. <laughs> um, uh, communicating back to Earth, would they be able to pick up uh, those signals? Well, I mean, you know, never say never, but I, I think it's very unlikely because those transmitters uh, have the benefit of knowing exactly where the receivers are, right? So they right, have, a, right. you know, a little dish behind the transmitter. And the transmitters are typically, you know, tens of watts of power, not much right? You probably have flashlights with some comparable amount of power as those things do. So yeah, they can, they can send a message to a big dish in the Mojave desert so that, uh, you know, the, the photos they're making of whatever object can be picked up by the jet propulsion lab or whatever. But the, the fact that uh, they're doing that doesn't mean that it would be possible for somebody in another star system, light years away, not just thousands, millions of miles, even billions of miles, but light years away, that would be a really a, a tough thing to do. Do um, uh, Are you familiar with uh, David Grush? A little bit. I've, uh, you know, seen what he said. Okay. Uh, what, what, <laughs> I can't wait to hear your opinion. I mean, it, it, it's what, what I find fascinating about Grush. Now, look, you know, two takeaways, right? Flying saucers, little green men, and we have them both. That's a, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty big ask. But when you look at his background and his his CV, his resume, um, he's he, he's a pretty solid, solid individual. 
why say these things and unless they were true? Because you're literally just throwing your career away um, if this, you know, and he's signed and swore on documents with the IG and uh, with Congress. Uh, so what what do you think's going on here? Yeah, I don't know. But uh, all I can say is you should beware of what is, in this case, to me, an argument from authority. Because he was uh, military intelligence or whatever his background is, I think that's it, uh, that you should believe what he says. But, you know, this this is such a radical thing. As they used to say, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And he hasn't provided any of that. When he was asked specifics about the information that he was presenting, right? Where did it come from? This, that, and the other. You know, he always backed off from that. He said, well, I can't tell you. I can't tell you. And well, so, he did, but he did. I mean, in his defense, this is, yeah, you're right about that. And I think that uh, th- uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And our community, which uh, has a pretty long leash at times, but in this case, they're saying, look, where's the evidence? But but Grush never said he had evidence. What Grush said was that the classified documents that he looked at, he has given to the IG. And those classified documents that have names and places and, and the evidence were given to Congress. And the next day after all of this broke, after he transferred this evidence through his attorney, Hearings have been called for, um, and the IG accepted his case as a as a and protection as a whistleblower. So that's that's the part where I'm just really, really, really confused. The IG saw something in that in that classified pile of stuff, and so did uh, Congress. Well, let me ask you this, Jimmy: Why would you need to classify it? Why couldn't you just put it out there? That's right. No, but that's exactly right. I think that especially now, Seth, where things have been pushed as far along as they have, that it, it's now time, if this is where we're at, to name names, whether it's companies or organizations or locations or whatever it may be. It's no, it's no longer acceptable to say, ah, it's... It's classified. I've 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 I've, I've got uh, my oath. I've, I've I've got this. I've got no 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 no. Now it's time to to do this, and maybe that's what the hearings will be there for. Yeah. Well, I I don't know. I mean, I've I've dealt with the Congress on a. <laughs> I've testified to Congress a couple of times, and you know they're they're just interested in knowing what you know, and they're not into conspiracy theories in general. So. In this case, what you want to do if you really thought you had evidence of extraterrestrials or extraterrestrial intelligence or extraterrestrial signals or whatever, you would want to put that out there for the science community to study the heck out of it, right? That's what you would want to do. And keeping it quiet just doesn't make any sense. When I ask people who think that that's what's going on, I say, well, why are they keeping it quiet? The usual answer I get is, well, because... The public couldn't handle the news, right? Something like that. And that Mm -hmm. doesn't make any sense to me because, you know, a large fraction of the public already believes that the government has this evidence and is keeping it quiet. And they're handling that news perfectly all right. Uh, They're they're perfectly all right with that. I mean, they still go to work in the morning. So uh, I, I can hardly believe that they would just go completely bonkers if the government said, well, we actually have this information that, uh, you know, there's, there's somebody out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hollywood's done a really good job uh, of desensitizing people. Yeah, if if you really think about it, not Hollywood in general, TV and and things where uh, the generations below my daughters, right? That that there's no question in their mind about uh, a, and it's it's because how they were raised and what they have seen. Um, so yeah, I, 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 the world wouldn't freak out at all. I, I think the world would just go, well, of course, yeah, the we knew that is a big place, right? <laughs> it's, it's giant. It's huge. There's gotta be lots of us out there. Um, uh, uh, to that end though, um, the, uh, the, when, when Grush said, 
uh, that we have uh, intact craft, intact, intact craft. Um, and, and he got into specifics, which we're not going to do here, but he said a couple of them were abandoned. They weren't crashed. They were just sitting there. The occupants were gone. And, and so we collected those. And he said, uh, and of course, you need some of these you need pilots for. So we have them too. So apparently we have aliens on ice. These are these are very dramatic statements. I think that uh, if true, Congress knew nothing about it and uh, uh, completely taken by surprise. Yeah, I, I don't buy it. I'm sorry, I don't buy it. You know, their, their pilots are, are, are missing in action. Come on, if you have an advanced craft from a society that's 10,000 years more advanced than we are, what do you need pilots for? Do you really still have pilots? I mean, you know, the, the fact that, well, these craft here, they could fly. They could really impress you uh, with their speed or their acceleration or their uh, altitude performance or something like that. But, you know, unfortunately, they, they've been just abandoned by the aliens or whatever. I mean, that, that, that seems so parochial. That, that suggests that they're at the same level of technology that we are. And that's highly unlikely. If they've been able to come here, they're not at our level of technology. Yeah, that's for sure. It, 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 there's no question about that. And uh, it, they're coming here, Seth, and I've, I've seen some crazy things. We're not going to get into that. But uh, they do it because it's just easy. That's that's all you just said. Uh, uh, In and Out Burgers, you know, two minutes, two miles down the road, right? Imagine two hundred year, years ago, you telling somebody, "Well, I'm going to get up at midnight, and I'm going to get in my car, and I'm going to drive, and I'm going to go through a drive-through, and I'm going to get a milkshake and fries and a double cheeseburger, and come back and eat it while it's still hot in bed." They would. That's black magic. That's voodoo. That's crazy town. But no, you you could do it right after the show tonight because it's simple. And E.T.'s not spending a million light years at the speed of light to get here. They're spending seconds doing it. And and I, I think Kip Thorne is, is 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 pretty on the money when it when it comes to ideas on how it would be done. Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, going faster than the speed of light, even for Kip. It might might be a little difficult, but what maybe what Kip is uh, <laughs> saying there is that when you go at high speed, you don't age as quickly as somebody who's not in your rocket, right? That's just relativity. So that means that you might only age an hour, but it might have been 10,000 years for anybody who was watching you, right? That kind of thing. So that allows you to flit around uh, the universe uh, if you have the technology, uh, you know, at high speed without uh, shortening uh, your lifespan. But I, I don't know. I mean, um, I love to think that the aliens are down at the local in and out That would be an incentive for me to uh, go check it out this evening. They would do uh, grilled onions, by the way, in that <laughs> double double, uh, w- without a doubt. Um, and 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 staying on this uh, uh, a little bit here, uh, when we look at two of uh, the most important, powerful people uh, of our generation, that's uh, J. Allen Hynek and, and Carl Sagan, and their careers, and as they moved along, they both flip-flopped, and they flip-flopped in the opposite directions. <laughs> it just made Absolutely no sense. And if you look at the timeline and the statements of them, that it almost happened at the same time, right there, late seventies, right, and where it seemed that Carl Sagan believed that we were that in uh, ET and and the possibilities of us being visited. And of course, he wrote the the book uh, Contact. And then J. Allen Hynek, complete skeptic at the beginning of Project Blue Book. And at the end, it was like he had nothing but regrets that that his his opinions and ideas about visitations to Earth uh, have completely changed. Um, is it, did you ever find that in, as interesting as I did, how they, they both flip-flop but went in the opposite directions? And they're both big brains. Yeah, well, uh, I, I don't know. I haven't thought about it too much, but I, 
you know, I almost took a job with uh, Sagan. So maybe I would have known more had I taken the job, which I did not. Uh, I just actually just uh, two weeks ago, I went to a conference in the uh, lovely, uh, what was it, Palm Springs or near Palm Springs, Indian Wells, actually. You, you may know mm-hmm. this conference. And, uh, you know, Paul Hynix, sorry. Yeah, that's right. Paul Hynek, Jay Allen's son. He's, Jay he's Allen's son was there. That's right. I, yeah, I always con- enjoy talking, you're talking about contact in the desert. I am talking about contact in the desert. And, uh, you know, that sounds like something that might be painful if you back into a cactus. But in fact, contact in the desert was kind of interesting for me. Uh, when did, what did you, uh, I, 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 I hosted that conference until a couple of years ago. Uh, what really? year were you there? Yeah. I was there this year. That's all. Oh, you were there this year. Yeah, oh, a couple, yeah. Couple, couple of weeks ago. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago. I was in New York filming, um, so I couldn't make it to this year's conference. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just, to watch, um, uh, the, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is uh, in 1977, uh, J. Allen Hynek wrote his book, The Report on Project Blue Book, right? And and Sagan is working on contact. And what uh, what Heineck says at the very beginning of the book is that we we don't apply science to this. I was on my own. And anything that had science involved with it, the the Air Force would scratch that off the list. They wanted no investigations at all. On the other side, you had Carl Sagan, who was trying to do everything to apply the science to it. It's the same argument that we have today, and you just said it yourself. We need to apply science to this, and there's not enough doing it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But I, I got the feeling that that was kind of a um, an agreed-upon strategy, if you will, for many people who previously thought that uh, that wasn't the way to go. So I guess I was gratified to hear that. What, <laughs> oh, well, what about, okay, the, uh, what about the other side of it, though? Um, uh, when uh, Stephen Hawking said, we need to keep to ourselves. Is, is that something that E.T. through their evolutionary processes would, would maybe adapt to and learn? which is, you know what, let's not let anybody know that we're even here and we need to run in stealth mode. Should yeah. we be thinking and, and considering that? Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> don't shout in the jungle is kind of the uh, the way it's often the paraphrase that we should, shouldn't make a lot of noise simply because you don't know what's out there. And, uh, you know, you broadcast transmissions, hey, we're the Earthlings and we got these great burgers you may want to, you know, sample. Just come to Earth and we'll we'll buy you one. I you know that might be you don't know that might be ba- dangerous. Okay, and that's kind of a paranoia. But I mean, you could make the argument and maybe you buy the argument even. But I mean, it's too late. That that sort of argument is is fun to discuss at a dinner maybe, uh, as long as you bring your own food and you're not going to be shortchanged by those. But it it's it doesn't matter anyhow because we are shouting in the jungle, right? We're broadcasting TV, FM radio. Those are high-frequency, high-powered broadcasts, as I mentioned earlier, and our radar. All of that's going out into space, and it has been, you know, since roughly the Second World War. So we've been telling the cosmos, particularly the local cosmos, that we're here. And if you're worried about it, well, it's just too late. It's too gosh darn bad, and and if the aliens really are hostile and they pick this up, you know, it could be that tomorrow is the end of humanity as we know it, because their interstellar battle wagons will arrive on our planet and just flatten the whole thing. I yeah, mean, we wouldn't even know that they got here if that was the case. Probably not. We wouldn't even know. Um, but in our neighborhood, okay, let's go back to that 125-year thing I suggested earlier. Um, would we then, ex- should we expect, kind of, I don't want to... Contact is such a great movie uh, for the for 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 think for thinkers. So, 125 years. So, if we split that in half, 75. Should we be looking at stars that are 75 light years away? 
and and have a, a real general interest in there. I, the last count that I have uh, that I've done on the, we've got about uh, three to four thousand stars that are uh, around seventy five light years away from our planet, where we would expect either a visit back. Or a signal back uh, if if you split that time in half, is that is that a good way to look at it? Well, it could be. I mean, I think we've actually done experiments like that in the past, where we said, "Look, how far away? What's the maximum distance at which any technological society would know about us? Would know about Homo sapiens?" And you know, it's basically the same calculation you just alluded to. We've been broadcasting for uh, 75 years or 80 years or something like that at, you know, the frequencies and the powers that they might be able to pick up. So if you figure half that, 40 light years, that's the distance to look at nearby stars, right? No more than 40 light years, because those are the ones that might have planets where the, uh, the Klingons on those planets know about humanity, and maybe they're inviting us to join their book clubs. I mean, yeah, and, and and not to be sarcastic here, um, because I'm I'm, I'm going to try to match your sarcasm because I wasn't sarcasm. I, I like book clubs. <laughs> is this uh, is is that the best that we've got? Right, where if there is a reception, um, of course, in in contact, it was Hitler in the 1938 Olympic Games, right? But let's say they pick something up and they 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 catch the honeymooners or leave it to Beaver or Gilligan's Island, and that's what's going to represent us. They're not going to get the illustrated history of an Encyclopedia Britannica, right? They're not going to get Isaac Newton uh, audio doing his own audio book, right? They're not going to get that. Um, is does that? Is is that the best that we can represent ourselves with? Well, maybe not. If you if you knew that whatever material you put together was actually going to be looked at by aliens, then maybe you would take some time to you know give them the best you got. And that has happened, right? I mean, think about the the pioneer plaques and the Voyager records, right? These are all messages to aliens, purportedly. Of course, I don't think anybody involved with those really thought that they would ever reach an alien audience, but, you know, that was the idea. So, you know, you get a bunch of people together, mostly academics, and you say, all right, here's your one shot. You've got this uh, record, this 12-inch golden record, and mm -hmm. you can record pictures, you can record sounds, speech, text, whatever. What are you going to put on it in case it's ever picked up by aliens? What do you want them to know about us? And, you know, the messages were all pretty much the same. I mean, you know, they would tell them a little bit about what we look like and our bio, our biology, that kind of thing. Something about our planet, how many humans there are, where we're located in the galaxy, stuff like that. And that all sounds pretty anodyne. That all sounds like stuff that's OK to tell them. Right. But in fact, uh, any aliens that are really worth their salt that really have some pretty good tech, they would do better just to look at our television. Let's take our break right here. Our guest tonight, Seth Shostak, senior astronomer at SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. We'll be right back. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Please visit all of our sponsors. We're taking a quick break here. All of the links are below. And we'll be right back. Join us November 10th, 11th, and 12th, 2023 as Disclosure Fest Foundation and Fade to Black Radio presents Stairway to the Stars, a human origins, science, and technology expo live at the Luxor Hotel and Casino on the Las Vegas Strip with live talks, lectures, and workshops by world-acclaimed researchers and authors. This is Jimmy Church, by the way, and I'll be your host all weekend long. Featuring topics like human origins, ancient technologies, indigenous teachings, workshops, a mass meditation, yoga and sound healing, music, and so much more. Don't miss our intimate sky watch and meteor shower over the infamous Area 51 airspace in Rachel, Nevada, with special surprise celebrity host guiding us through the night. Also introducing our Disclosure Fest VR Starship Area with dozens of rides. You've got to check it out. This event will sell out. For more information and tickets, please visit Disclosure Fest. Org. 
The secret is out. Life Waves X39 is the reason why I have got my vision back. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you need to go straight to HealingWorksNow.com. That's HealingWorksNow.com. Works with an X. All of the information that you need is on that portal. Find out why I look great. I feel great. I'm thinking clearly. I sleep. I dream. Life is good. All of it. You've got to check out Life Waves X39 and all of their other products. It's all simple to do. Go to HealingWorksNow.com. That's HealingWorksNow.com. Works with an X. Hey everybody, it's Billy Carson, also known as Forbidden Knowledge. I want to talk to you about a very special event coming up July 30th, 2023, the Forbidden Conscious Awards. We're going to honor people who have been contributing to the conscious community for decades. People that you know and love that have helped you get to higher levels of thought and consciousness and awareness. It's going to be a live in-person event, but seats are going to sell out very fast. You want to make sure you're there in person. And guess what? You can help vote for the winners. Voting is available on ForbiddenKnowledge.com. And the categories are going to be social media influencer, podcast slash radio host, TV host, actor, director, producer, entrepreneurs, health and wellness, philanthropists, authors, field researchers, archaeologists, space anomaly hunters, and of course, a Lifetime Achievement Award. I'll be your key note speaker that night at the Forbidden Conscious Awards. We have celebrity guests performing. We'll have a halftime show where we're actually going to perform music for you. And don't forget about the pre-event mixer where if you buy a box seat, you'll be in the VIP section and you also have private access to a VIP mixer with celebrity guests. Shake hands, break bread, network, and then walk the red carpet with us and take amazing photos. It's going to be a night to remember. You don't want to forget this. Make sure you hurry up and get your tickets because they're selling out very fast. I want to see you there. Forbidden Conscious Awards 2023. River Moon Coffee, makers of the Fade to Black blend. Truly the best coffee on planet Earth. Just visit rivermoonwellness.com or or their Amazon store. It's all simple to do. You can check out the Fade to Black blend, the Game Changer blend, or any of their Black Moon Wellness products. It's the only coffee I drink. It is the best, and it's Doc. Again, rivermoonwellness.com. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black, I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight is Seth Seth, Shellstack from SETI. And uh, Seth, uh, just... Moving this along, um, I have uh, I, I have flip flopped a lot over the last uh, five six years since the breaking news, the New York Times, right? Leslie Kane, Ralph Blumenthal, and the Pentagon has a secret UFO program and all that stuff. Uh, excuse me, sorry about that. And uh, but this Tic Tac thing. Um, the videos, I'm not buying the videos, they, they, they don't have enough for me, but, uh, the description of the Tic Tac from, uh, Alex Dietrich and, and, and David Fravor, um, and, and, and others, uh, that were part of the Nimitz battle group describe something that just doesn't fit in our laws of physics. Uh, and laws of physics, I, th- I think, are different around the universe. It depends on where you are. But what do we do with that where you have a professional witness like that that describes something that is absolutely impossible uh, where we are with t- technology today? Uh, how do you deal with it? Well, I, I think I'm going to have to ask you, Jimmy, which uh, give me an example of something that you think you know, truly violates physics. I, I've, I've looked at the three videos and, you know, you can go online and find uh, Mick West's uh, analysis of these things and others, and they're explicable without invoking anything particularly esoteric, right? Just mm-hmm. commercial aircraft and stuff like that. But if, if there's something that you think violates physics, let's talk about that. Well, okay, specifically... Um... Uh, the the Princeton and their sensor data was picking up these objects. Okay, and this happened over a period of days. 
But uh, when uh, Fravor was uh, instructed to to go out and check these things out, it was detected. This is where, for me, I, I just I st- I scratch my head. Uh, going from eighty eight thousand feet to sea level in a fraction of a second, and then stopping. I would think, in the world of physics, you would have some sonic movement, some atmospheric pressure, and disturbance on on the on the ocean that would have created tidal waves, and, and that that's blindingly fast, right? Yeah, <laughs> G, G forces uh, that that are inexplicable. So, um, just that description, and then of course. No propulsion system. It was 40 feet, shaped like a tic-tac, no wings, no airfoils, uh, no vapor trails, nothing nothing that would indicate a, a, an engine or a propulsion system. Yet, it, according to Fravor, flew away in, in the blink of an eye and, and left him. So, yeah, I would say that that's defying a lot of our, our understanding of physics. Yeah, well, it would if you went from... How many feet was it? 88,000? 88,000 feet. Okay, 88,000 feet. Well, that's, uh, you know, that's many miles. Um, but you you don't, do you know that it actually, you know, came down to the surface of the ocean? Or do you know that it was seen at 88,000 feet and then a fraction of a second or whatever? Later, it was seen at, the, at sea level. That right? is because correct. That, yeah, well, if that's the case... Then all you can say is, well, something caused it to become, you know, invisible, if you will, at eighty-eight thousand feet. At the same time that something lit up near the near the ocean, and it was only an apparent uh, motion, and it wasn't necessarily, you know, real yeah, motion. Yeah, I, I would I would say yes, except, uh, and again, I have I've been on the skeptical side of this fence for for many years, uh, trying to understand what is going on. Um, and, but this, this didn't happen once this happened multiple times over multiple days. This wasn't a one-off thing and where you could uh, say that it was sensor data or something else, or is it our tech? Is it, is it something that we have developed here on this planet? Maybe we were testing it on, uh, uh, during Navy drills. I don't know, but, uh, it is just something that, uh, for Fravor and Alex Dietrich to describe what they describe, this thing was, you know, was hovering over the ocean. He flies in his F-18. Uh, you know, what is that? This thing starts following him in this corkscrew motion and is and is chasing his plane. And his wing person, uh, Captain Dietrich, Alex Dietrich, she says, you know, she's witnessing something that she has no answers for. And that's it's it's like, what do we do with this information? And and uh, we have to have a certain amount of trust in the men and women that are defending this country and what they are seeing. Yeah, and, but and backed up by the sensor data. Yeah. Well, listen, I, I can only make general comments because the specifics are, uh, you know, I can't say too much about that without looking at the data. But in general. Witness testimony is a very poor uh, indicator of science. I mean, you don't learn much science from witness testimony. That's first first point. So, yeah, you saw something high up in the atmosphere, and then you saw something uh, very low in the atmosphere. Now, it doesn't mean that it's the same thing, but, uh, you know, if it was, then it obviously had to move very quickly. But if it's an, a real physical object that's moving that quickly, that quickly, not only is there some question about what the propulsion system is, but there are things like, you know, why didn't it immediately heat up to incandescence because of, you know, friction with the air and that kind of thing. So I, I, I don't know, but there's there's also this, and this actually carries a lot of weight for me. And that is we have thousands of uh, Earth satellites in orbit around our planet. You know, something like 8,000 of them are looking down on the Earth, right? So if we were being visited by a strange craft, right? they would be being seen all the time by these these uh, satellites. And you can say, oh, yeah, well, they are, but the government's covering it all up. Well, look, they're not all government satellites, and they're not all American satellites. So you have to invoke this very widespread 
conspiracy to hide all this information. And every country on earth that has a satellite up there is doing the same. And that strikes me as less than credible. Uh, okay. When uh, 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 one of the directors of national intelligence uh, two years ago said that we detect fast movers coming in and out of our solar system and our atmosphere with our satellites all the time. And we, we know when they're arriving and, and we know when they enter the atmosphere. These are, that, 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 that's not, that's not an eyewitness yeah, but, from but, a but, swamp. But who's, the, who, who's saying that? Jim? Uh, I, I, I don't have his, it's one of, uh, one of the, uh, 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 one of the DNIs. Uh, I'll have his name. I should have done. I, that I don't care about the name, but I'm just saying. You know, uh, director, of the national, uh, director of national intelligence. Yeah, uh, because to say that they're 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 seeing things coming in and out of our solar system all the time. I don't think the DNI DNI cares about our solar system. They care about our airspace. But what do they know about what's happening out near Neptune? I don't think they know anything about that. I'm just using his words, and, okay. and, and so what the, the here's here's what, what what is interesting when you have somebody like uh, Mick West uh, who has debunked my stuff, and I love it. Right? It's 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 not the eighty percent that we can figure out. Not everything is a UFO. Come on, we we all know that, but it's the other five to ten percent of the unknowns that that are should be of interest uh, to us. And, and back to your point, the eyewitness testimony part of this, I myself being one, we're talking about millions and millions of people that have seen things. Most of it explainable, but it's that small fraction that is unexplainable, that is of interest. And uh, it, it, it's too easy to say there's nothing here. There's nothing to, that, that nobody is visiting us. That's not, uh, eyewitnesses put people in prison for life, for murder on eyewitness testimony. And so it's good enough for that, but it's not good enough for, for anything else or to, to tell me that I haven't seen what I've seen. So that's that's the is, is there some kind of crazy common psychosis between uh, the millions of people and all of the military records out there? That's the part that is confusing to me. Yeah, you're giving me a great straight line. Is there some sort of common psychosis out there? Yeah, there might be. I don't know. But look, you know, uh, the, the fact that you can't explain all of these things. I mean, uh, people have looked at uh, various sightings. That uh, that are reported because there are a lot of them reported every year. It's somewhere between five and ten thousand sightings are reported every year of putatively alien craft, and those are the reported ones. Those are the ones where people took the time and went to the trouble of actually reporting them, right? So undoubtedly, many many more were seen, and something like eighty percent of them, or whatever, ninety percent of them, can be explained uh, as you know prosaic uh, occurrences. There were aircraft in the area or whatever. Uh, there were meteorological phenomena, whatever. But there's always 5 or 10% where you say, I don't know what it was, and it doesn't fit the profile for some of these, if you will, prosaic explanations. But that doesn't mean that they weren't prosaic and you just didn't have the evidence for it. It's, it's you know, jumping to the conclusion that because you can't explain 5% of them, that those are alien craft. That That's, you know, that's a mistaken logic there. Uh, no, actually, no. I think it's the opposite. I think it's the exact opposite. And, and, and there's reasons for that. If we absolutely dismiss any notion of E.T. visiting this planet, we've closed off our minds. Oh, well, we, I agree and, with that. But, but, but that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that they couldn't be here. I'm simply saying that you can't prove that by saying, look, they're 5% of things seen in the sky that we don't know the cause of, right? That doesn't prove it to me. Well, yeah, okay, but we need to apply the science. And even with a, a case like um, uh, Avi Loeb and Oumuamua and his excellent book, Extraterrestrial, right? And where all he does in that book is analyze the data. 
And and as you know, you're a scientist. It's it's about observation and measurement. Observation and measurement. Observation and measurement. That's that's what you do. And you're an eyewitness, by the way. <laughs> you're observing, right? And so, um, uh, but Avi went up against the scientific community that uh, that absolutely just wanted to dismiss this because the evidence wasn't observable anymore. Omo is gone. The only data that we have is the data that we collected for those eleven days. That's it. There is no more data to collect, and we will never collect any more data on Oumuamua. But but Avi analyzed that, and he came to the conclusions that he did that it was not natural and that it was something uh, uh, that happened to fly by our planet that wasn't uh, created in nature. And that, that's applying the science, and I think we need more of that. Yeah, well, listen, I was the first one, I think. Well, maybe not the first one, but I, very early on, I applauded Avi Lope for indeed having the guts to come out and say, well, look, you know, let, let's consider the maybe the radical explanation for what a muamua is. Maybe it's an alien craft, right? Now, he didn't swing too many scientists onto his side. And I don't think you can say that it was because they were, you know, pre uh, inclined not to believe that it was an alien craft. They weren't going to go with that no matter what the evidence was. I don't think that's true. I think that they would have if they thought that the evidence for that was good. What could be better, right, than to be one of the discoverers of a visitation to Earth? That would be fantastic. But, you know, if you talk to people, and I did, uh, you know, who study a- asteroids, uh, that's their job. That's, their, that's how they earn, you know, the money to buy dinner at night. They study asteroids. So they know the colors of asteroids. They know the reflectivity of the albedo, as it's called, of asteroids and so forth. So they know what asteroids look like when you're looking at them from 100 million miles away, which was about as close as a muamua ever got to us. And and they say, you know, uh, yeah, maybe it was an alien craft, but it also fits the uh, the the parameters that you would expect if it were just an astero- asteroid. So. All right, Avi Loeb doesn't think it's an asteroid, and I think it is an asteroid. So where are you? It's not coming back, as you say. We're not going to see it again. But presumably, if it was an asteroid, we'll see more of these things. If it was an alien spacecraft, we might or might not see it again. But if it's an asteroid, you're going to see more asteroids. And you can say, well, and, you know, what do you think this one is? Yeah, I, his uh, he's got like 100 points in the book that that he lays out. But for me, uh, the main ones uh, was that it increased speed without uh, an, any gravity assistance. There was no vapor trail. There was no ejection that you would normally see from a comet. So that didn't cause it. It went from 200 and change, 200,000 miles an hour to 275,000 miles per hour. It increased speed as it pulled away uh, and headed out of our solar system. And it made a turn without any gravity assistance. Um, And then the fourth point that, uh, like I said, there's 100. Um, He said that he believes it was flat like a pancake. That it was it was not long. He said all of the artist's renditions of it uh, are just fantasy. It's just what somebody has pictured in the we we got no imaging of it. We just got a ten to one reflection ratio uh, as it as it came around the sun. Um, but he said that he felt that it was flat as a pancake and exhibited with the amplitude of the ten to one ratio a metallic surface. Now that that's that, that's that, that's that's data. That's not. He said, uh, and one last point. He said that Oumuamua exhibited no properties of any known asteroid that we have ever observed, as in zero. Yeah, that's suspicious, right there, Jimmy. Uh, you know, if it doesn't look like any other asteroids, then you know, either it's an asteroid of a type that you haven't seen before or it's a faulty observation, or a faulty interpretation, or it's an alien spacecraft. You know, choose your poison. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's why the book is called Extraterrestrial. <laughs> it's a good book. Have you read it? I have not. I have not. I've spoken uh, more than once with Avi 
And uh, yeah, he, I, I, I like Abby. He's a great guy. Yeah, he's a great guy. He's fan. He's just a great guy. Um, uh, what are the plans? What are the plans? It, it happens, right? You get the signal in. What's up, Earth? Yo, 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 right? You get it. It, it comes in. What are the plans? Well, uh, I, for one, intend to go buy myself a good dinner. Uh, the, the plans are uh, as follows. So there, there actually is um, a committee, which is called the Post Detection, the SETI Post Detection Committee. And in fact, I headed that up for quite a while. Uh, it you know, designed to come up with a protocol, which is a very evil sounding word, but it isn't intended to sound evil, uh, a protocol for what to do if you detect, in fact, an alien signal, right? And the protocol, I can tell you what it is, and we've had endless meetings. Uh, this is an international group, by the way, whether you consider that a good thing or a bad thing. And it, 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 the protocol is very simple. It simply says, if you find such a signal, the first thing to do is confirm it, right? Don't just believe it because you found it. Call up people at another observatory on another continent or whatever and give them the coordinates of this thing and you know see if they can find it too. Okay, that's just good science. Make sure that you're not fooling yourself. Uh, but the, the next thing that it says is tell everybody, right? Because you want anybody with a telescope to look at whatever it is you found in space. And the third thing, which is really the only interesting thing in this protocol, is uh, don't try uh, responding to this message, you know, sending a reply, hi, we're the Earthlings, whatever. Don't do that without some sort of international uh, consultation. Now, that sounds as if it may reflect, you know, something, uh, I don't know, a security related or something like that. But that's not the intention at all. The idea of having that in the protocol was simply so that one country didn't monopolize, you know, the phenomenon by, uh, you know, only taking data itself, not telling anybody else where this thing in the sky was, that sort of thing. Now, these, these are the protocols, but I can tell you this. Every time people have thought that they picked up a signal, and there have been a couple of false alarms, not many, but a couple, nobody follows the protocol. They just don't, they're not considering the protocol at all. They were so excited that they continue to look at it, and then they, you know, occasionally will call up somebody at another observatory if it gets that far. But it, in fact, up until now, it hasn't really gotten that far. Um, uh, what there's got to be step four, step five. Who who calls, who calls CNN? Well, uh, actually, our experience with such things is that if we pick up a signal that's looking kind of interesting, right? The, the people involved are sending emails to their relatives, right? Or they're texting their wives or husbands or whatever, saying, hey, you know, uh, don't tell anybody, but, you know, we picked up this thing that looks pretty interesting, that sort of thing. And our experience with that has been that immediately, within 12 hours, the New York Times is calling you because somebody will tell the New York Times. The, the last time this happened, it was uh, uh, Carl Sagan's widow, actually, Andrewian who called the New York Times because somebody told her, I guess it was Jill Tarter, told, told her about something that we picked up that looked pretty interesting. She immediately, you know, called the New York Times. So they began calling me, right? It, it, it spreads very quickly. It's, you know, impossible to squelch this because, uh, or squelch this, uh, or quash it, either one. It's yeah. impossible to do that because it's such a big story that everybody wants to run with this story. Uh, and what about... James Woods, who's going to deal with James Woods? And and would you expect, you know, I say that in, in, in jest, but um, is there, is there a plan in place? I mean, would you see a national security uh, issue brought up and this information being clamped down before you have a chance for Andrew to call the New York Times yeah. uh, or somebody else. Well, I like James Wood. I, I think <laughs> I've always enjoyed his portrayals on the big screen. But uh, in fact, it's not clear to me when, when people say that, oh, you know, Seth, you know, you're just making this all up. You know very well if you guys picked up a signal, you know, the government would come in and shut you down, right? That's what they say. And I always respond to that by asking, but, but why? Why would they shut it down? What, what is the harm? You know, uh, 80%, some 
polls have shown something like 80% of the public, the American public, believes that, uh, you know, the aliens are not only out there, but they're here, right? right. So, mm-hmm. so what is this going to do for them? I mean, why do you think that the government would keep quiet the fact that we picked up a signal coming from 50 light years away, right? I, I don't understand that. Well, but is there a plan in place? Uh, so in the release, uh, aside from a leak and somebody calling uh, the, the New York Times or, or what have you, um, what is the plan of, of releasing the information? Do you contact the White House immediately? <laughs> you, you know, the, the National Science Director? Uh, uh, you going to reach out to the Pentagon? Are you going to bring in, you know, what, 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 what are the steps? Yeah, well, n- none of the uh, documentation I've seen on this, and, you know, I, I guess I've seen all of that at an official uh, level that exists, None of it says, okay, now first you call the Pentagon and, and then you call the, uh, you know, the Defense Intelligence Agency and then you call the CIA and then you call your mom. I mean, it, 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 nothing specified like that. It simply says that if you pick up a signal, verify it, as I mentioned, and then tell everybody, make it public, make it public. It doesn't say that you should first make it public to, you know, people inside the beltway. It doesn't say anything like that. Right? It just says make it public, right? Because what you want is that, the science community can go out and study this thing and verify it, you know, not least of which verify it, right? Because this is important enough that you wouldn't believe it if only one group could find this thing. Why do you think uh, we've got this sudden interest um, at the official level um, in, in UFOs now called UAPs, right? But we're talking about UFOs here in alien life. Um, why the sudden interest, where and and you know you've put up with it for years, right? The tinfoil <laughs> hat and and you've you've dealt with your own drama with this and and trying to talk about this, the funding uh, the funding uh, arena is difficult, and and SETI has fought their own battles for this, and uh, the and the but now all of a sudden aliens are in. Right. Why? Who has flipped the switch and why? Why the sudden interest? We've got we've got committees now. We've got agency. We've got Arrow. We had the UAP task force. We've got protocols now in place. We have a UFO czar and we've got senators and representatives uh, talking about this. Um, And there isn't a there isn't a, a press briefing at the Pentagon uh, uh, any day now without the mention of UAPs. Yeah. That's where we're at. What, what's, what's going on? Got me, Jimmy. I don't really know. I mean, there isn't any development that I'm aware of in terms of observations or science or any other indication that this subject is more uh, worthy now than it was 10 years ago when there wasn't nearly so much uh, interest. I mean, there always has been some interest at the government level, uh, in particular for the Air Force, because the Air Force wants to know what's in our airspace for obvious reasons, okay? And so I, I think it's just the fact that there have been these uh, reports mandated by Congress. Now, I've, as I mentioned, I've, I've testified a couple of times to, uh, to Congress about this subject. And, you know, the Congress people, at least the ones in the room, uh, were very interested in it. And, you know, I think most of their in- interest was generated by, you know, late night television or whatever, I mean, because they would ask questions about what really happened at Roswell, stuff like that. But but there's also a legitimate interest by the Congress in this because it's a matter of, a, a, you know, national defense. If there really is something flying around the skies here, you know, you I, I think the Air Force is going to want to know that. You would want to know that. United yeah. Airlines would want to know that. And, and But... There, it, there's a reason for it. I don't think it's it, those reasons that you just gave. Those have always been there. It, there's, there's dangers of flying through a flock of birds uh, with a jet. Okay, so we understand you don't want to hit objects in the sky. We get that. We're talking now, uh, uh, ET, extraterrestrial life. Um, uh, recovered flying saucers, bo- alien bodies on ice, and and th- the truth needs to come out. This is not 
it sounds like a fade to black show, right? That's what it sounds like, but it's not. This is what is going on in Washington, D.C. Somebody has flipped the switch to the on position, Seth, and I want to know why. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe your show's too good. They've uh, they've all, all all you know decided to f- that fade to black has it right, and we're going to inquire. But uh, as I say, I remember talking to uh, Congressman Lamar Smith from Texas. Uh, he's out of Congress now, but he was for a long time, and he was involved with these things in the Congress. And he would have me, you know, come in and and, and talk to the Congress about this sort of thing. And, you know, they would do studies and this sort of thing, trying to understand, well, is there any good reason to think that there's there's something here? Is there really, you know, a there there kind of stuff? Uh, and, you know, as far as I could tell, there never was. But the their interest was obvious. I mean, aside from the whole alien angle, their interest was in being sure that there wasn't something up in the sky that we didn't know about that we ought to. I mean, maybe it was, you know, Soviet craft in the old days, something like that. Right. Uh, I don't know how many people really in the Congress really thought that it was extraterrestrials, but they thought it might be military craft from somebody, uh, some other country. And we certainly ought to ought to know about that. Now, what about uh, some of the other considerations here? Um, we've got uh, the the testing that's going to happen from the asteroid Bennu that's going to be here in September on its return journey finding amino acids and, uh, you know, the basic sugars and RNA on asteroids just floating around in the vacuum of space is a pretty interesting subject and may explain how we got here in the first place, uh, uh, panspermia and so forth. We have that. Um, but uh, on the other side of it, we've got Europa, right? Uh, we've got, well, we've got Mars, and the the possibility of life existing right here in our star system would do a lot to push things forward, wouldn't it? And, and again, in this funding environment. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I certainly agree with you there. I mean, the facts are the only biology we know about in the universe is right here on Earth, right? Uh, but there are at least seven other worlds in our own solar system. Most of them are moons. You've mentioned the, you know, the moons of Jupiter, a couple of the moons of Saturn. These are all places where you might have liquid water, right? And if you have liquid water, you're going to get some chemistry. And if you get some chemistry, maybe you're going to get uh, some, you know, big molecules that can reproduce, and we'll just call that life, right? So, you know, that, I think that that spurs a lot of the interest now. Uh, astrobiology wasn't really such a big thing 30 years ago. Nobody was talking about looking for life in space, except for a very small number of people. But it, it's become, you know, not only legitimate, but I would dare say fashionable to consider that maybe life isn't just restricted to this planet. And in a sense, you really want that to be the case, because otherwise, we're some sort of miracle. And I can tell you, Jimmy, that my my neighbors, at least some of them, think that we are a miracle. But if you think that you're a miracle, you're probably wrong. Yes. How many atoms are there? Uh, I think it's like 10 to the 81 or something like that. It's a big number. It's a big number. Uh, how many ways can particles combine? Well, uh, they can, yeah. It's a very finite number, right? Okay. Well, it's, it's not so finite, actually. I mean, <laughs> but, if you're talking about 10, 10 to the 81 atoms, you know, the number of ways but, that those can combine, that's a... That's a sophomore math problem, but nah, uh, it's a nah, it's a nah, big nah. number. It's a tiny number. No, it's a tiny number. And 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 wh- where I'm going with this is that th- there's only so many ways that particles can combine, and duplicates. And then you know, physics is doing, especially quantum physics, is doing everything they can today to show us and convince us of the multiverse and parallel worlds and 11 dimensions and entanglement and, and multiple versions of us and, 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 and so forth that there are infinite sets out there talking about SETI across the universe. It's a, it's a big, big place. Scary and thought. This, it, I know. Right? <laughs> and, and so that, that life is actually common. It's not unique. It would have to be that way because Atoms are atoms, particles are particles, and and we've got, you know, those basic sugars floating around on, on asteroids, seeding planets, and this is how it gets done. 
I, I just don't think it's, it's it's abnormal. Well, I mean, we don't know. We only have a sample of one. We only know of one locale in the entire universe, which after all is big, really big, uh, as <laughs> they say in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, you know, we only know of one. Now, as soon as we find a second one, if we do find a second one, right, that, that picture changes entirely because once you have two of something, then you know that there are a lot of them. Right. right. The right. only numbers right. in, in physics are, you know, one, two or infinity. So if we get to two, we'll, we'll, we'll know that we're well on our way to infinity. Um, and there you know, could be a lot out there. But I mean, here's something for you. It's maybe not not so important, but maybe it is. And that is life got started on the Earth somewhere between three and a half and four billion years ago. You know, let's say three and three quarters billion years ago. The Earth was very young then. It was less than a billion years old. And that means that as soon as the Earth could support life, as soon as there was, you know, rain and, yeah, right. it, it got started right away. That right. suggests that it wasn't a very hard thing to get going, right? If it got started so quickly, it's just like walking into a Las Vegas casino, putting a quarter in a slot machine and winning the jackpot. I mean, it could happen. But if it happens the first time, you think, man, you know, these these jackpots are really uh, – Really easy. easy. Yeah, it's easy. It's, this is what I'm going to do for a job. Yes. Um, what? So, you know, the old story, right? The uh, the the flying saucer on the White House lawn. And, and, and it happens. E.T. comes down and says, all right, or is or show stack. Uh, OK, we've had enough. Uh, we we, we got to talk to this guy. What 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 should what what would you do, and and how how would we if the meeting happened, right in a very public forum like that? Uh, what should we do, and and what would you do? Well, I you know I haven't given a lot of thought to that. Obviously, you'd want to establish some sort of conversation. I mean, if they were here uh, to do do you harm, if they were here as hostile visitors, you know, it really doesn't matter what you want to do because they're going to be able to do it. If they can come here, right? If they can, if they have the capability to come here, they can do whatever they want to do. But if they've come all this way just to obliterate humankind, I mean, that's a really expensive project with, from my point of view, not much gain for them. So, so presumably they, they're not here to do that. And I would ask them, you know, the, the kind of questions that I've always wanted to ask an alien, namely, do you have music or you know, do you have religion? I mean, questions like that. But what you'd really want to do is uh, indeed learn as much as you could from them. I mean, you might have asked the same question, you know, 500 years ago. Okay, uh, you you folks here in the Caribbean, you're sitting on this island. What if a ship arrives tomorrow with a bunch of Europeans in it? You know, what are you going to say to them? What are you going to do about it? Right, that kind of thing. And it turns out it really doesn't matter what they want to do about it. But you know, it's it's a very analogous situation, I think. Well, but but your point is valid, and you said earlier that uh, if if they get here, they're way in front of us, right? If they're coming here, <laughs> there's no question about that. With with where we are today, with our ability to comprehend and to understand, would we be able to? understand what somebody a million years in front of us could our our science the real science is 300 years old right that's it if you if you think about it now where are where are we going to be in 10,000 years would we even under be able to understand ourselves in 10,000 years let alone uh an extraterrestrial intelligence that shows up here would we be able to understand what they would have to tell us? Well, I think that's up to them. If they want us to understand, then they'll, uh, you know, they'll they'll dumb it down for us, right? It's like my uh, eighth grade teacher. They're gonna <laughs> they'll dumb it down. They'll, they'll show us pictures to uh, set up a, a, if you will, a dictionary so that we can convince, sorry, converse, uh, you know, at uh, a reasonable level. I mean, but if they don't want us to understand, if their only message to us is well, sorry, you guys are, uh, you know, you're late on returning some books to the uh, Galactic Library. We're just going to obliterate your planet. I mean, you know, we, we don't really need to understand that. It's just going to happen. But I, I think that if they wanted 
us to converse with them if they wanted to communicate. They could probably arrange that in the same way that, you know, if we could somehow turn you back to the time of uh, the cavemen, as they're called, right, to, to the homo sapiens of uh, 50,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, uh, you, could, you could learn to communicate something to them, right? You don't both speak a common language, but you, you could probably communicate at some level. What is it that, uh, I mean, there's the obvious, right? Free energy, you know, if, if, uh, but, but what, what, what would we want to learn? I mean, what, what would be the, I mean, is there life after death? Uh, how, how can we figure out consciousness? Um, oh, by the way, I wanted to ask you about consciousness. So let's uh, circle back before the end of the show. But, uh, you know, there's these fundamental questions, but what would be most important? Uh, or should we just not learn anything at all and just keep doing our own thing? No, I, I think that if you can learn something from them, that might be a great thing, right? I mean, come on. If you if you could go back to the time of the Romans, which after all isn't that far back, you know, go back two thousand years, and you could talk to Julius Caesar or whatever, and and tell him of some things. Well, what would you tell him? You know, you, you know, maybe you'd read poetry to him or sing some songs or something. But you would also tell him about you know the the way the world works in terms of. Uh, society, civilizations, war, all that kind of stuff. You would have a lot to tell them with the benefit of 2,000 additional years of history under your belt. So I, I assume that the aliens would be able to tell us stuff, uh, even aside from practical things like, you know, what's the cure for death? I mean, that right, might be interesting right. to learn, but, right, you right, know. right, right, right. Well, see, th th you couldn't tell Julius Caesar about the Internet. Well, you could right? tell him about it. I mean, he, he, he wouldn't know how to build one, but he could... would not, which I, I'm agreeing with you, though. You know, you can't there's only so much that he could relate to. Uh, he couldn't you could tell him about the Internet, but he could it doesn't even have electricity. So uh, it would be a pointless discussion. And I think that would be the same thing with E.T. Um And I think that that it may be consciousness based. I think that that would be. Uh, what the revelation would be uh, for you. Do you think consciousness exists in the physical or the non-physical? Yeah, well, consciousness is one of those mysterious things that the brain kind of creates. I think you probably agree that whatever it is, it's all, in, you know, between your ears, it's in the brain. And the brain has somehow figured out how to turn, you know, small currents of electricity into the feeling that you know you're a, you're a, not only alive that you're sitting in a room and it's got a whole bunch of musical instruments hanging behind you and that kind of kind of stuff right that that's a, an illusion that your brain has created for you and uh, so yeah i don't even know remember what the question is but whatever it is your brain has created well, yeah what well, what comes first the chicken or the egg right consciousness is it is it is it chemistry or is it is, is it something that exists outside of the physical and has nothing to do with with chemistry or, or uh, you know, physical creation? Well, uh, take me as a literalist, but or maybe uh, one who thinks that uh, science could really explain consciousness. And that is, I think, you know, it's it's just chemistry. It's just things going on in your brain. It's just physics at the basis because chemistry is physics. That's my take on it. You uh, don't have to believe it because it's nice to think that maybe there's something, I don't know, spiritual involved, but I don't think that. Yeah, I don't. Uh, when when the conversation goes into that word spirituality, um, I am so uh, undecided in, in, in that reality. And you know what the easiest answer for me when it comes to that um, is that Probably aliens from another world have been visiting this planet for millions of years and Homo sapiens have been interacting with them and they didn't have another word for it. So they became gods. And that's, and I'm, that's an easier thing for me to understand 
and and accept than than anything else, and especially when it comes to spirituality, that uh, yeah. and that contact has been made for a long time, and and there's we didn't have a word for it. But did right? they make any pictures? I mean, our ancestors, if they were being visited, you know, have wouldn't it, they make pictures of these guys? Have you ever seen the, there's a thing called the Bible. There's a lot of, see, the, here's the thing. And again, I'm not a religious person. Okay. So, uh, but here's the thing. When you go, um, I don't know if you've been to Egypt, but when you go and it, it, have you been to Egypt? Yeah. A couple of times. Okay. Um, uh, when, when you, when, the, the things that you witnessed there were, were going back uh, 5,000 years of alleged history. It could be longer, it could be shorter, whatever. But 5,000 years of, of this connection to the stars and communication with the heavens and information coming from above. I don't think that that's imagination. I don't think that that's made up. I think that there was clearly contact being made, but they didn't have words for it or a way of expressing it, Seth. And I think we have to accept that. Well, I don't know. I Sorry, Jimmy, I, I don't buy it. But I, <laughs> I, I, I think that, the, I mean, look, if you look at the you know, hieroglyphics or whatever, you look at whatever it is that the uh, Egyptians tried to convey to people who are, you know, tourists in the tombs or wherever, you know, they would, they would make this, uh, they would write these texts. Uh, you know, they had to do with their mythology and maybe the person that was buried there and stuff like that. They never, you know, never told you any quantum mechanics, right? They, they never told you anything that they wouldn't know. So I, I don't see any uh, evidence for visitation there. Uh, you know, you and I over pizza and beer, <laughs> we, could, we could go toe to toe uh, with this. Um, but that's not what this show was about. Um, but I am what 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 I am fascinated with uh, when it comes to this subject and where knowledge comes from is if we accept the dogma of history, and that's all it is. It's just dogma. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. But if we accept the dogma that at three thousand BC, Stone Age man, three thousand BC. Stone Age man is, is in the deserts of the Sahara foraging for seeds in the dirt for dinner and then rolls into Giza a hundred years later and builds the pyramid. A hundred years. A hundred years. You went from zero to the atomic age overnight. I'm, I'm not buying that. No, no. Yeah, but, no, but, no. but that isn't it's, what you see. I mean, if you go, if you go to Egypt, you've been to Egypt? I have. I'm going okay. in uh, again in a couple of months. I just okay. got back. All right. Because if you go there, you you see, to begin with, you see imperfect pyramids, right? There's the bent pyramid and stuff like that, right? Pyramids, which you, they're kind of falling apart, where they obviously didn't know how to build a good pyramid, right? That was something they clearly learned. And they learned it over the period of, you know, centuries. You know, it wasn't something they learned over the weekend. It took time. But you know, that suggests that, well, there wasn't any external knowledge here. This is something that they, they learned themselves. And uh, also, if you look at the, some of the buildings that they were building before the pyramids, uh, what are they, mastabas, whatever, you know, they were things where they would pile one story on top of another story kind of thing. And, you know, that was the, the, the starting point for the pyramids, right? It's not that the pyramids... Uh, kind of appeared overnight in Egyptian history. But so they did. But they did. If you you can go in any textbook, you can go in and do any research on the internet. You can go anywhere you want and you will see that they built 30 pyramids at 2800 BC. And and that includes the Giza plateau. So, and they're, when, when they say that uh, Khufu, the Great Pyramid, was built in 20 years, well, you know what they don't, t you know, with 20,000 slaves and two and a half million bricks, you know what they don't tell you? That the pyramid next door, Khafre, was built at the same time. So that means double. That's 40,000 people. That's 5 million stones. The dating 
is the same for both of those periods. But they don't they don't tell that they, they don't express that part because that would throw everything off kilter. Well, why, does it, why does it throw everything off kilter? Because it, 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 that the the population of Egypt in the entire country at that time was about five hundred and fifty thousand people at three thousand BC. That's it. So you're saying that ten percent of the population that every every able bodied person in Egypt was building a pyramid. The bent pyramid that you brought up, and the step pyramid, and the red pyramid. All of these were built at the same time, and they all took the same amount of people to build. They're all the same size. The Bent Pyramid, you've been there. That thing is friggin' ginormous. People don't understand how big it is till you get there, and you're like, oh, my goodness. They built all of those at the same time. So, no, I I, I don't believe that Stone Age man went from some, from nothing to that in 100, 150 years. I just, no, I just, I no, and you're right about the mastabas and the step pyramid, and and so, but that was that was just a hundred years prior, a hundred years, a hundred years. That's it. That's it. Well, I, if they had built an automobile, I would agree with you. But a pyramid, it, it involves not much more than a big workforce and the ability to pile stones on top of one another. You have to cut them up, and then you pile them on top of one another. I don't know that. It, it's, yeah, it's not know, like it's not like they built, you know, uh, FM radios or anything like that. <laughs> I think they did, but yeah. here's but 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 Seth, my point being is that there's so much that we just don't understand, and I, I refuse, and I think that all of it, we cannot close our minds down. We have to continue to pursue this stuff and and pursue and pursue knowledge. Um, when you go to Egypt and you see, you drive around the country and you see hundreds of sites and it's just like, who built this and how did they get this done? It, it's, it's, it doesn't make any sense. There's a simpler explanation. I just haven't found out what it is. Well, well what happens when you tour around, say, Greece or Italy? You see all, these, are, all this stuff built and it wasn't built. That's the best right there. That's the best argument you can have. Because when the Great Pyramid was built, Rome didn't happen for another 2,600 years. <laughs> Greece didn't happen for 2,400 years. Yeah. 2,400. So, yeah. Two and a half thousand years later, could Rome be built? Yeah, sure. 3,000 years later. We're talking about 3,000 years prior. Yeah, yeah, that I, I love that. And, and, and do you extend this uh, argument to the pyramids that were built in the Americas? Uh, well, the the aging is 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 a bit different. Uh, yeah, again, they're, they're much younger. Two, yeah, they're you know you're off by two thousand, almost three thousand years, and so uh, yeah, yeah. I I can't. Egypt is a, is an enigma to me. I it just it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, I, I don't know. Seth, I, I just really enjoyed this conversation tonight. What do you think is next? We have Arrow. Uh, we have uh, uh, th these committees looking into this. Um, some are saying that there's going to be something pretty dramatic announced uh, in 2023. Are you expecting something? Or are we going to roll into 2024 with more of the same? Uh, well, I don't know. Obviously, I don't know what I don't know. And that's what you're asking. But uh, I'll just fetch you a cup of coffee there, Jimmy, that uh, we're going to roll into 2024 more or less at the same place. That's my guess. We'll see if it's right. And if I'm wrong, you at least get a cup of coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm expensive when it comes to coffee. Um, <laughs> have have you uh, gone in and talked to Arrow? Have they reached out? No. They have not. Congress? But I, don't, but I, don't have, I, I, I've, I have spoken to Congress. Yeah, but not recently. It's been a couple of years. Uh, so if these hearings uh, kick off, uh, well, they, they're, we've got two that are scheduled right now. If there's an invitation extended to you about your efforts in in this, uh, would you uh, would you would you go and 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 sit down once again? Yeah, I think I would. I mean, I have to tell you, I grew up in the D.C. area, so I have a lot of friends and even the occasional relative in the D.C. area. So. 
I would look uh, kindly upon an invitation. It would give me an excuse to visit those people. I would love to come up and, and I, I've said this to you so many times, but I would love to come up and hang out uh, and, and see what you guys do up there. We're practically neighbors. So Seth, thank you for all of your hard work. Keep doing what you're doing. And when the announcement comes, I know I'm not on top of the list, but uh, let me know a little something, something. Okay. All right, Jimmy. Great to talk with you. Thank right. you so much. Have a great night. Seth Shellstack right there from SETI. And I'm telling you, and I will always say this, um, their work is important. It's important. We must continue to search. Thank you so much, Seth. Uh, tomorrow night, right here, Rick Doty on Fade to Black. That's right. For tomorrow night, we're going to be talking about the recovery of craft and and what is going on that and so much more tomorrow night right here on fade to black thank you seth shellstack all of that you've got to check out his uh, podcast by the way all of his links are below don't forget fade to black t-shirts are back the links are below the game changer memberships are back the links are below and over on our website help support the show all right. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee Newman, and Michelle Freed. Thank you to Dennis and Kevin. I want to thank Drew the Geek for his hard work over this past week. Music by Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJC Arbor, the Game Changer Network, and this broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2023 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black of the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Till tomorrow night with Rick Doty, I want you to be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy. Yeah, yeah, yeah.